they're all feeding a giant organization that is also supplying the United States with drugs and other horrible things. And they're also fueling a war that's killing and consuming humanity in, in Mexico at a rate that is sometimes out, out and surpasses a war setting. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually it could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Change Agents, an ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. Today's episode is about the rise of the Mexican drug cartel, the power that they wield from the perspective of former Mexican counter-narcotics officer Ed Calderon. Ed Calderon is a security specialist and an instructor with operational experience along the U.S.-Mexico border. He was born in Tijuana, and he spent years in law enforcement with an operations group specializing in counter-narcotics, anti-abduction, and high-risk close protection for high-profile individuals. Ed has consulted with and trained federal law enforcement agencies on both sides of the border, from the FBI to BORTAC and intelligence service agents on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. He also hosts the Manifesto radio podcast. A few stats about the power of the Mexican drug cartels. The U.S. Attorney General, Merrick Garland, has recently said that the Mexico-based Sinaloa cartel is the largest, most violent, and most prolific fentanyl trafficking operation in the world. From a PBS NewsHour investigation, Mexico and China are the primary sources for fentanyl and fentanyl-related substances trafficked directly into the U.S., according to the Drug Enforcement Administration. More than 100,000 deaths a year have been linked to drug overdoses since 2020, and most of them are fentanyl-related. This is a topic, specifically fentanyl, that has come up on every episode that I have done with specialists, whether they are talking about the southern side of the Mexico border or working specifically the northern side of the Mexico border. So let's dig into this, and I hope you enjoy the conversation with Mr. Ed Calderon. If you could, uh, give me the wave tops of what your career looked like in the police service in Mexico. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, firstly, the uh, the operational side, which is where everybody gets started there. Uh, you get divided up into uh, groups, small groups. I think like the first one I was a part of was about 12, 12 man strong. Uh, these cells would be basically moved around the city. Uh, randomly by a command structure up top we wouldn't know where we were going at times um we would get handed orders down and we had sites that we would exploit basically hey this building that building over there these are people of interest we need you to disrupt whatever they're doing there so basically shit starting stuff is what we did operationally at the start uh we would hit a house and that house would lead us to find a few blackberry phones or a laptop or uh, guns or a people's names somewhere and we would have people there we interrogate those guys and that would lead into a whole night of finding other houses um this was every night um you can't go on vacation the first year you're active so so basically you work every fucking day what 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 came who came up with that rule probably some asshole um it's an interesting policy for sure yeah. So <laughs> first year of it was no, no stopping. You would go from night shift to, to day shift every two weeks, a uh, single day of uh, uh, a single day of being off. And you would just go, it's, it's every day uh, living in a military barracks uh, for some of it, living in hotels and uh, living in government buildings. You can't live on your own because it's suicide. Um, so as soon as I got out, and I was started working operationally. I started getting a good reputation, and people started pulling me into more specialized groups and more specialized units. At the at that time, there was a there was a there was a pretty 
active and forward commander who took notice of my work and basically hired, grabbed me as part of his um, close protection uh, a guy, basically a bodyguard of a sort, but we were basically working together in this specialized things. Anything that was high impact, that's, that's where we went. Uh, that was the start of my career uh, there. That, 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 that was years of that, probably two, three years of that. We would work with the military uh, a lot. They didn't know their way around the city. Uh, we worked with the first uh, version of the feder of the Mexican federal police, as you see it now. They, back then, they were basically army guys dressed in gray that would ride in the back of the trucks with their FANF uh, with uh, not with G three H and K G three rifles. Giant. Some of them were shorter than the rifles. You know? <laughs> And most of these people that are in the military in Mexico, specifically the ones that were in Baja, were from southern states. So they didn't know their way around, and they were completely out of their element. So we would be embedded with them. Um, it was a lot of running around at night and a lot of running around during the day, basically, uh, doing very hairy and scary things. Um, uh, that was three years, almost four, of my career. Um, and even when we got the uh, the ability to have vacation time, <laughs> I I think I spent two, three years without going on vacation. When I finally did, it was because of a of a severe head injury that I had during work during a work related altercation. Um, it was during some of the I mean this is two thousand four and forward. This is right at the start of the militarization of the drug war of the kickoff of it basically. Um, we were being used as an experiment in a lot of ways, things that they would do in a micro uh, at a micro level in Baja were then done at a macro level across the country. Um, so uh, that led for, to us being trained in the US uh, by uh, the people from the Department of the Navy. It led us to be trained here in Mexico by other members of the military in the US that would come and advise and train us into a lot of, a lot of things that we didn't uh, have any concept of and uh we got a reputation uh a very good one at least at the beginning uh we were the ones that would show up when they would call them you know we were trusted we were uh we were one of the we were the best paid police organization in mexico not only that we were certified by an american policing certification program called calia so we were we were doing good work you know mm -hmm. the, 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 we were actually certified by an american police uh certification in Mexico as Mexicans. That was unheard of and still is pretty mind boggling to think about that. Um, issues started happening, you know, of course, like a lot of people that I was working with would flip, um, you know, you could be trusted and go through all the verifications and background tests that you want and polygraph tests, but somebody shows up with the right number, you know, and you could flip on, you could, people would flip. Uh, you know, as you're uh, describing this, I was just thinking about kind of that situation. It could either be a number or it could be leverage. Yeah. And it sounds like you guys were definitely targeting cartel activity. And maybe you don't have like exact data to support this, but I'm curious your thoughts now looking back. You guys were obviously focused on the cartel. How much do you think the cartel was focusing on you guys and trying uh, to figure out how you guys were? A lot. I mean, I, yeah. I, I my phone that was a government phone got called to many times. Yeah. But, that only people that were in that group would know. Um, we got targeted directly, you know, that again, the whole hunting of cops was directed at us, that whole propaganda thing they did because they were engaged in propaganda. They had people in the media, you know, they had people within our institutions for recruitment. Uh, we found an emergency contact list in one of the safe houses we hid for ourselves. So it was, it was a, Everybody knew about this when, when the, at least the people that I work with. So nobody was, well, nobody in my, my immediate close group of people that I work with would be, was stupid enough to go home after work. Uh, we would go either to a military barracks to stay at or keep ourselves basically uh, clear which led to a bunch of issues. Again, uh, basically it meant that I couldn't have a relationship with anybody. My family saw me every now and then I would show up like a ghost randomly at parties and stuff like that. unannounced. Um, suicide was a big thing in my, uh, in my uh, unit. I, I lost a few people to that and it's pretty much related to 
both the pressures of work and also the pressures of not having any sort of personal life. I, I, I the isolation. How, but, uh, the isolation aspect of it was yeah. horrible for some of us. And for me too. I mean, I just, uh, I, I was, I had already been through that for, since I was 13. So I think for me, it was just a natural fit, but, but for some of them, it was pretty devastating. Uh, but there was a con concert. And when you say, when, when I say cartel, you know, it's not one cartel. Tijuana at that time was basically a war zone between two large factions of the Sinaloa cartel and the local Tijuana or Ariano Felix cartel. And both of them had interest in either using us as a tool, influencing our actions, or killing us if we got in the way. Um, and the only support we had of any kind was through the military. Uh, and even they were... Everybody has a side in Mexico. There's always influence. Uh, people have to realize, uh, you know, and I get called out a lot because hey, you were part of that in corrupt institution. You were corrupt too. Uh, that doesn't work that way. Money doesn't, you know, money doesn't flow down. You know, money flows up, shit flows down. <laughs> you know, anything that we would find or we will get, we were not in any position to negotiate with anybody or do anything because we didn't know where we were going to be the next day because yeah. that we were that comp compartmentalized. Uh, but some of the higher ups, you know, you, um, the the guy at the top of this uh, the security structure in Mexico at that point is now in federal custody for cartel ties in the U.S. Martinez Luna, he was the one that was in charge of verifying that all of us were be to, to be, like went through the uh, through the filtering process and to, that we were to be trusted. That's who was in charge of that whole thing, and he turned out to be a, a you know cartel guy. So how long, how long did you do the job for 12 years, all in all 12 years? When did you, when did you know it was time to move <clears throat> on to the next? Uh, I, I went through a, I went through, I mean, th that operational experience that I had and as a way to, as a, we, we'd say, we would say to cool me down because I went through years of it and it became apparent to, to some of my superiors that I, that I was, that was burned out, uh, I was a functional alcoholic at that point. Uh, that severe head trauma, but that was undiagnosed. Um, PTSD that doesn't even that wasn't even considered as a thing back then, um, and a bunch of other issues that I had going on. And um, there was an alignment of time where I was basically they were trying to figure out where to put me to to cool me off and. Uh, the whole of the security team of the governor of Baja, California, was found out to be cartel plants of a sort and, and, and infiltrated. So I was going to start my vacation process, and, and all of a sudden I was called in to get interviewed by the director of the, of, of the institution that I was a part of uh, to see if I would be willing to take on the responsibility of the governor and his family as far as the head of security, um, which I had no fucking clue how to even do. Dude, I've never bought a suit in my fucking life. I didn't know anything about convoys. I don't know anything about armored vehicles. I didn't know shit about any of that. Luckily, I had trained with members of NSW that had experience uh, in Afghanistan like doing car size protection detail and yeah. some of them had done state department packages across the globe for shit so that's who the first people i called were them and they kind of schooled me on some of the things that i needed to kind of get into my head as far as that he was one of the most at risk uh governors in the country not only because of the fact that he was the governor of baja but also he was basically going hand in hand with felipe calderon at that time who kicked off the drug war who was a very close friend of his and he was also the head of the national security council so he was a very very hot potato uh so i basically had to develop this overt military security apparatus around him in two days <laughs> I mean, at least they give you, a, you know, a lot of time. Yeah, two days and figure this out. Then <laughs> uh, imagine a skinny. I mean, I don't even know how old. I don't even know how old. I'm probably 26, 27. Uh, dressed like shit. You know, I had a mohawk when I was operational. At sometimes we didn't even have any fucking standards. I'm here you know? for it. I, I support yeah. that. Yeah. I walked into a car armoring place in Tijuana, one of the first ones that came that uh, 
that opened uh, to ask to see the guy because I was there tasked to buy four armored vehicles. And they left me in that fucking waiting room for about an hour and a half. I not know who the fuck I was. Um, and then when they found out, you know, so I'm here to buy four vehicles. Who the fuck are you? Uh, it was a learning experience. Uh, yeah. He uh, he basically uh, again took the, took to, took the fight to them. Um, it was uh, it was very apparent that I went from a uh, you know active direct action go and get people to now let's try and keep this guy from not being got and his family from not being got and also we have to regain the trust of these people because all the people that were here before us fucked that up. So that was towards the uh, the, the, the the second half of my career. I, I went into that. Um, I learned a lot, traveled a lot, went to Washington a few times, traveled mm-hmm. in the U.S. a few times, traveled across the country, uh, got to see how some of these strategizing, planning, and execution of some of these p- processes and policies that actually had a great success in Tijuana and Baja specifically. I think it's one of the only successes in the drug war if you can say that uh that they were uh in the, in that whole period and uh i finished well in that job you know uh, it, uh he went out of office and like everything when ha- that happens people go back to where they're from and i went back to operational work which i did for three more years um and it was basically imagine you uh you know you do all this work you set up all this training you set up all these processes and everything is set up in such a way where you trust all the people there and all of it is set up and you you, you think that's going to be waiting for you when you get out um most of the filtering process they did like polygraphs and and background checks and some of the investigations that led to a lot of the people that i used to work with being let go or fired from the job because of lack of confidence got hired back hmm. because uh they went legal and a lot of them basically got a lot of that overturned. So known cartel associates and plants were now waiting for me at the office on my way back. And I've just been very visual and visibly next to one of the guys that went after all of them. And I was received with a lot of hostility. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more fired up to introduce the presenting sponsor for season two of Change Agents, Montana Knife Company, founded by somebody that I feel very fortunate to call a personal friend, Master Bladesmith, Josh Smith. Not only a Master Bladesmith, but the youngest Master Bladesmith and one of the most experienced in the world. Montana Knife Company blades are some of the finest that I've ever been able to get my hands on. They are the sharpest knife out of the box and they're some of the easiest to resharpen when you dull the blade. I take them everywhere that I go. I have them in every vehicle that I own and every backpack that I ever take into the backcountry. Specifically, my favorite blade of theirs is the Speed Goat. It's lightweight, but so incredibly capable. I never leave home without it. If you're familiar with Montana Knife Company, you know it is often very difficult to get one of their blades because they sell out within minutes of being released. What you should be able to find in stock are the Blackfoot 2.0, Speed Goat, or a Stonewall Skinner. And if you use the code CHANGEAGENTS10, that's going to net you 10% off of your first order. Again, my personal favorite blade is the Speed Goat. If they have them in stock right now, don't mess around. Put it in your cart and complete the checkout. Montana Knife Company, they build working knives for working people. And like I said at the beginning, I could not be more proud to collaborate with them on Change Agents Season 2. There's a lot of things I like about the Mountain Tough program, but I think primarily what I enjoy is they focus on mental toughness in addition to just the physical toughness. Everything they do is grounded in one purpose, life transformations and being strong between the years in the mind. And there's also a community of 15,000 plus Mountain Tough athletes. So the community is strong, they're supportive, and they're gonna help keep you accountable. So you can train anywhere, You can stream anywhere. You can access guided training and on-demand workouts right from your phone, your tablet, or TV or computer, whatever you're into. And everything you need is in one spot. The Mountain Tough subscription gets you access to all the Mountain Tough programs 
new programs, and bonus content. And they have programs for everyone. Those who hit the gym and heavy weights, those who like to work out at home with no gear or minimal gear, and everything in between. Mountain Tough has been the trusted training by the dedicated for years now, including U.S. military special forces and dedicated backcountry hunters. There is no excuse for you to not start the day. With Mountain Tough, you can conquer your goals with the ideal program for your lifestyle and schedule. Train with equipment or just your body weight on your phone, tablet, TV, or web browser. Most importantly, they will help you train your mindset so you are always ready for anything that life throws your way. Mountain Tough subscribers get full access to world-class home and gym programs, groundbreaking mental toughness training, self-improvement, prehab and rehab, biomechanical form coaching, stretching and mobility flows, nutrition guidance, challenge workouts, and the global Mountain Tough community. Mountain Tough is offering Change Agents listeners an incredible offer. You're going to get 40% off on the all-new Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription with the code CHANGEAGENTS. Go to mtntough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to receive 40% off, a savings of about $100 on your Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription. That is mtn, Mike Tango November, tough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to save 40%. That is less than 50 cents per day for the best in-class physical and mental training. How long of a memory does the cartel seem to have? I mean, you obviously were in this role. Yeah. The cartel was looking for you guys, but you're still living in Tijuana. Do I'm they, not, yeah, I'm do not, they, well, I'm not, li- not yeah, I'm living. Not, you know, yeah, 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 I can move around. So, is, but does the risk diminish? Do you think the cartel gives a fuck about you anymore? Or like once you hang the hat up, they don't give a shit? So, one thing I'm really happy about is that I, I was never one of the information guys. Like I never had access to anything. Uh, and uh, all the leadership roles I had were basically like the, the farthest I went in the uh, command structure, I was a regional sub commander. That was the highest I went into, into the, uh, into the power structure. It's a uh, sub commander, regional commander. And from there it's sub director and director. So that's, that's where I was. So based again, people would tell me where to go. So I didn't have yeah. any plans on my own. I never took anything personal. I never stole anything. I never grabbed anything for myself. I went through a shit ton of confidence exams and they looked into all of my things because of the access and the people that I was working with directly. And also I was replacing people that were found out to be plants. So they went through me with it. They went through all my shit with a fine tooth comb. Um, the two major organizations that were fighting it out back then basically killed each other off. Uh, a mm-hmm. lot of those people that were back working back then and a lot of the people that we worked against are either dead or in prison or irrelevant realistically in that process because that's a th- phenomenon that happens in Mexico is you cut one hand off and it turns into two. Yep. Or you cut one hand off and then the other head changes name, changes strategy, and changes the whole thing, and it's a whole different on animal now. Um, I... I do, I do travel to TJ. I don't live in Tijuana. Uh, I do travel to TJ and I keep my, you know, my eyes open and stuff like that, but I never took anything. I was never part of any team. I never worked on any of the sides. I kept myself clean. And, uh, there was a, the man that I worked for, Lieutenant Colonel Lizaola, uh, again, one of, he got not, he has nine assassination attempts on, and you know, the last one took the use of his legs. Uh, I had him on the podcast recently. Uh, the podcast that I run out of Tijuana, he, he had a, he had a warrant out for his arrest at the time we filmed that podcast, uh, because nice. the powers that be don't like him and don't like anybody that worked on that at that time. You know, they, all, all of us are basically war criminals in a lot of, in their eyes. So a lot of the pressure and the risk, I guess I, I, I see and feel is not from former cartel associates of any kind. It's mostly political. That's the that's what I worry about specifically. I talk a lot about China. I talk a lot about the current yeah. government, the corruption levels that it has in a very public way. I've talked to Congress about it, congressmen and people in Congress about it. And I speak about it openly in a lot of giant uh, platforms and a platform like this one. So that's what I worry about specifically. You know, that's the risk I take. I, nobody like me is out there with a voice uh, because. I don't know. Either they didn't survive or they didn't figure out how to get here. 
Well, I like that you focus on those things and I like that you're vocal about them. I've talked with uh, a few people from journalists to, you know, Border Patrol agents working on the American side. And we've talked about everything from, you know, child craft, trafficking, fentanyl, um, a variety of issues. And it's interesting how a lot of it does come back to China. You know, China's not making fentanyl, but perhaps they're shipping all of the precursors to Mexico where fentanyl is being made and then it's it's working its way up. Can you give me, because I do want to talk about China. Sure, sure. Can you give me a snapshot of the current situation? And I, and I mean everything from the police, not necessarily the units that you used to work with, but just the overall tie between you know cartels and police and the corruption there, and then the political side as well. Sure. sure. The reason I ask you is if you go to, it almost seems impossible, I, I, a better way to frame it would be, I don't know where to point people towards in the U.S., in the media, where they're not being fed a galactic amount of bullshit about what is going on. Yeah. Um, so first <laughs> off, uh, first off, I'm an, Im- an immigrant to the U.S. I did it legally, and I am earning my way to citizenship. I I am part of a business, and I have well, charities that we work with. We've raised money for veterans, we do a lot. Uh, I'm not a journalist. I am somebody like yourself that uh, through experience gained a knowledge base that is now part of our opinion on things. Um, I don't talk about things from I remember or I think this is what happened. I was there for some of the origin points of some of the issues that are now exploding uh, in the US. I mean, I was a part of the group that found the first cartel drone on the border. Like I, oh, really? I found one of the first quad drones with a giant load of meth underneath it. And I had to Google what the fuck I was looking at. Right. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I also was a part of a lot of training and I trained a lot of, uh, members of law enforcement in Mexico and I have connections and still talk to a lot of them who are spread, uh, uh spread, uh, between some of the army SF groups, some of the uh, Marina SF groups, also some of the federal units and what the remains of them, because it was an institution that was completely gutted uh, by the current leftist organization that is running Mexico. Uh, so my opinions come from that baseline. Uh, I have no stakes in the game. I, I am not part of any political party of, uh, of any kind, and I can't vote in the United States still till I get in citizenship. So I want to preface everything by that first. Um, Mexico is, I think like right now it's, it's, it's in, it's in a civil war that is basically being ignored. It's it's, it's very much a civil war of a sort. And the first indication that I saw of China's participation in all of this was specifically in, in related to the ports of Mexico, um, Anything that comes into Mexico from the ocean comes through a port, and all the ports are militarized in Mexico. They're run by the Department of the Navy in Mexico. The amount of times that we saw members of these units and as far as higher-ups, and again, we had eyes and ears everywhere as as well as probably they did. Uh, So we would witness, uh, you know, Chinese businessmen that would run giant maquiladoras or business interest in, in Baja and other places have meetings with members of these institutions that were weird, you know? Um, I got to witness the shift of, uh, the shift of, uh, you know, some of these uh, methamphetamine crystal meth uh, processes go from like small batches in some weird lab- laboratory somewhere to now industrial level loads of it with giant crystal shards are showing up on, on the on the street and also showing up in cars that were loaded up to go to the U.S. And a few times we found some Chinese nationals in some of these laboratories, basically showing and educating some of these people to do what they do. Uh, it became quickly apparent to me and to anybody I asked, because we like, who do we ask? You know, we did our research. I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine who was in the intelligence community. He said that any, any Chinese national is part of the Chinese state. And as such, they're all members of, they're all, they're all Chinese intelligence, basically. There's no such thing as separating, you know, 
Chinese criminals and, that are acting independently of the Chinese state. This doesn't work that way. Like yeah, everybody is country structured. Yeah. Everybody's in on it basically. And as soon as we started asking and poking around and commenting on that shit, we were shut down immediately. So we knew, I knew there was something there. Um, and this is early on when that methamphetamines are being basically mass produced. And then it shifted to fentanyl. As soon as the marijuana legalization happened and products started shifting and uh, things started changing around that and then giant pot grows in Mexico started not being as valuable as they were in the past. Uh, somebody started figuring out that you can take some of that low potency heroin grown on some of those fields and add fentanyl into it. And these people were not Mexicans. These were, these were Chinese nationals that were already in Mexico as part of the pharmaceutical industry, because that's, that's their, that's their foothold in Mexico. That's how they got into Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, there's a famous case of a Chinese Mexican national Sen Li Jae Gon, which has the record as far as the amount of money uh, found in a single drug related bust over a hundred million in his house in cash in cash. Holy shit. That must've been a big house. It was a lot of suitcases and it was everywhere. There was luxury watches. So like people were counting that money naked in a room. And it was, it was a whole thing. Um, That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, and when you see that case and you see what he was involved in, he was involved in legitimate pharmaceutical industry stuff in Mexico. So it, was, it wasn't like they were smuggling hidden containers of fentanyl or methamphetamine precursors and that like a, in a, a secret compartment, a hole in a ship. They were pumping it in directly into the pharmaceutical industry and guess who was a part of that pharmaceutical industry? You know, some of these members of some of these cartels were basically there just to take, well, well, take this for us and do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how that started to grow. Um, we start to see, uh, and I think the U S caught on to it later. Uh, we start to see some of the Chinese banking industry and some of these banking maneuvers that they were doing in their own money processes having some links to places in the U S you know, that's how they would make money disappear on the U S side and make it appear on the Mexican side. Uh, money brokers from China that were using some of the Chinese institutions to move around some of that cash, some of that money, you know, in the past you would see uh, cars loaded with money driving down to Mexico, you know, that you would see some of that. That's not that common anymore because that's passe, you know, not using yeah. that anymore. So you start seeing clear, evolution of some of these criminal organizations what their influence from some of the supply networks in China. And then uh, I guess probably four, uh, probably six years ago, almost seven, I guess, you'd start seeing a clear sign that at least one of these giant criminal organizations in Mexico, the new generation cartel, was very, very much being supplied and equipped by some sort of pipeline from Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, people have seen the videos of these guys wearing signal disruptors on their kit, basically these yeah. uh, modules that will interrupt any sort of ability for somebody to call out or phone or radio or some different frequencies. It's a jammer for lack of a better term. It's uh, what yeah. we used to use as well. Yeah. Imagine those, but made in China and smaller, you know? Yeah. And each of them are, they're carrying a bunch of them on them and they have a bunch of bootleg Black Hawk gear on made in China and a bunch of uh, plate armor and helmets that clearly made in China and a bunch of just soup, like a bunch of tactical gear that clearly comes from Southeast Asia and China and drones and um, pill presses that are manufactured and sold by official institutions in China that are now being utilized to make a bogus pain medication with fentanyl and laced in them. And all that originates from a Pacific side base cartel, the new generation cartel who has access and control over some of the major ports like the one in Colima and Manzanillo. And you can clearly see a pipeline and a sign that they're basically in cahoots and or somehow influenced or proxied by China. And when I started talking about this way back when, I think uh, I talked about it the first time I was on Rogan, I was, I was called, I was called, I was fucking making shit up or I was uh, hallucinating this or it's, conspiracy of some sort you know or i was somehow racist for saying that and anti-china 
and I when when uh when COVID hit, the Sinaloa cartel was smuggling fentanyl from the U.S. into Mexico to load their drugs because they don't have access to the Pacific side ports. And the new generation cartel exploded in influence and power during that time because the pipelines didn't close for them. You know, supposedly yeah. China was in lockdown. You know, why were ships still showing up? Do you think that that relationship between China, I'm just trying to think about, you know, is it mutually beneficial from a monetary <laughs> perspective? Or do you think that China is at a point in their supply chain? Because especially if the economics of the cartel is largely being derived through that trafficking, is it at a point where China can actually exert influence over those cartels and almost use them as a proxy against the U.S. if they want to? I, I think it's clear that at least with one of them, it's true. It's, it's probably true uh, with the new generation cartel. You've, you, we've heard stories, and there's a, a bunch of people out there that are way more qualified to talk about this, but I'll speak about what I know and heard of illegal iron ore mining uh, along the Pacific side of the country. Uh, that these cartels would that they would hire cartels as security to basically mm. keep people away from them. Uh, there was a whole hoopla online probably ten years ago about these uh, self defense uh, organizations that came up in Mexico. These auto defensas, you would see them wearing white t shirts. I think Netflix actually did a documentary on some of these guys. It turned out that none of them, not most of them, were not citizens arming themselves to fight the cartels. They were just basically another version of the cartels, uh, trying to gain control of a whole plaza. And some of these guys were being hired by illegal mining operations in that area to extract iron ore. Um, so yeah, yeah, they, they've they've clearly figured out ways of manipulating and using some of these uh, influences. And 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 uh, they, I mean, I think they've done the same in places like Africa. Yeah. Um, but what I see is, yes, they are clearly probably being used as a proxy group of some sort. Now, I don't think their intentions are just uh, exploitative as far as exploiting resources and making money off them. I see them as a weapon, a weapon as, of this destabilization and influence in your second largest trading partner in the world and also your neighbor to the south. That's what I see. Good morning, everybody. As you know, Change Agents is an Ironclad original. But what you may not know is that for over a decade, Ironclad has worked with brands and individuals to create world-class films, series, podcasts, and ad campaigns. In fact, I've been working with Ironclad for the past few years. I was introduced to them on a project through the Navy SEAL Foundation. I've worked with them uh, on a variety of projects, even up here in Montana, long before they proposed the idea of change agents to me. They're the best in their field. And I say that because there are plenty of people out there looking for the best, looking for the cream of the crop, looking for the top of the triangle. And if you're looking for that, you need to look no further than Ironclad. If you ever need media by way of film, a series, podcasts, or ad campaigns, they have you covered. You can reach out today and follow them anywhere at This Is Ironclad, the ampersand, and then This Is Ironclad, or visit them online, thisisironclad.com. Again, www.thisisironclad.com. You have China is one of the largest, if not the largest trading partner for the U.S. So from an economic consumer facing, I mean, where do your Apple computers come from and your iPhones? If you ever order one and you check the shipping label, I'm here to tell you right now it comes from China with a lot of other things. And so they have that economic front. And then on the back end, I mean, it's it's a long play, but destabilizing the country in and of itself through what they are pumping through using the cartels, if that is in fact what they are doing, but destabilizing a large por portion of populace of the United States. Yeah, it's I mean the things that they're, the the, the current what a federal, weird, but an, an interesting two sided uh, battle though. You know, it's very asymmetrical. You see the uh, you see the political structure in Mexico right now basically being formed to a single unit. There's no competition. There's a single political party in Mexico right now. We're getting we're heading into Venezuela territory. All airspace in Mexico is now militarized. Old ports are militarized. The army is patrolling the streets in a policing role. There's no alternative party. And the only party right now is running on a platform that is openly 
uh, openly supporting uh, Venezuela and Russia. It's uh, openly anti-America and anti-U.S. Um, it's utilizing uh, it's utilizing migration and some of these caravans as a weapon and as a bargaining chip. And where have you seen that before? I mean, the poll, the, the, the right now in Poland, they're basically doing the same play with yeah. uh, immigrations, weaponizing them. Uh, if people are thinking it's a conspiracy theory. They can look at how that's going, uh, that's going on in that part of the world, and how Russians are using the, the same processes of uh, weaponizing immigration. Um, but you're seeing a shift in politics in Mexico that is very to the left, and it's very openly. Uh, pro China and pro Russia. Uh, you, you, one of the political candidates that didn't make it past the uh, the the uh, the uh, election process, as far as their 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 what candidates they were going to put forth, mm -hmm. by the name of uh, Ibrat, uh, unveiled this uh, national security program that he wanted to to uh, implement in Mexico, which is still going to go forward, just another under another name, and basically showcased AI. Uh, facial identification, um, monitoring, surveillance systems that are all sourced directly from China. And you would see this giant picture of Xi Jinping on one end, you know, behind him as far as like, we're, China's giving us this technology, we're going to fight these cartels and we're going to read their license plate and all this technology is going to be utilized against them. We're basically going to be turned into a giant magnify, uh, microphone and magnifying glass uh, on your southern border. We're going to be part of the Chinese state in a lot of ways. That's that's and people can say it's a conspiracy, and I get a lot of fucking hate and sh and, and, and heat from it. But people with eyes get to see will will, have, will will tell you Mexico is turning into the Venezuela like uh, place. Uh, you described it as, you know, Mexico right now is going through a civil war. If you were a betting man, who would be the victor of that? How do you think it plays itself out? I mean, the the ones right now, who, who's winning? Uh, the, 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 the military complex is winning in Mexico. That's who's behind every the power in Mexico. Um, we had a recent uh, WikiLeaks style leak of documents from the Mexican military, and they themselves will tell you that certain parts of their institutions will favor one cartel or the other they're basically playing chess with these people and taxing them <laughs> so they win um china's influence and interest clear interest in exploiting some of the uh resources in mexico are there you know the u.s obviously has a lot of interest in that as well uh but the practices that china has uh, put forth in other parts of the world uh, leave a lot to the imagination as far as uh it being beneficial or not uh, it's Mexico is clearly being utilized as a fire underneath your feet. Um, if people don't believe that, look at the border. Just look at the border right now and the amount of people that are being not only bussed and driven up there. You see videos of people on trains. You see people videos of people walking. You rarely see videos of these fucking buses that somebody's paying for in cash, bussing people straight to the border. And you also very rarely see videos, and this is something that's a direct call out to the media because uh, people see this directly and somehow the media isn't fucking covering any of this shit. Uh, a group of people with children and women going into a bus on the southern border and then the bus is full of men just showing up on the northern border. Where are the kids? Where are the children? Where are the women? You know? Yeah. Um, this is obviously a weapon that is being utilized against the United States, and it's a de destabilization weapon of some sort. Um, and also, people need to fucking get over the fact th these aren't Mexican migrants of the past that would come across and 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 then go into construction and build most of the housing uh, housing in California that that lend into some shit later. This that's not who's coming across that border. Prisons are being emptied out in most of South and in Central America and South America. And where do you think they're they're legitimately emptying out prisons and fucking putting them on their way? And not all of them, some of them. These are people from Africa, you know, North Africa. Uh, these are people from Southeast Asia. Chinese nationals, a shit ton of Chinese nationals there with passports, Chinese passports. Um, they're from everywhere, and. You know, people worry about the, the the drugs and you know coming across that border. The biggest money maker for the cartels right now is taxing people that cross that border. 
That's their biggest money maker. They're in control of that. Um, it's clear to anybody that has eyes to see, and this is not a political statement, I guess, uh, immigration in the U.S. is a political thing. When I talk about it, it... Apparently the type of milk that you buy in the U.S. is a political thing. If I talk about immigration, I'm immediately called that I'm a pro-Trump guy or I'm a fucking conservative or some sort of sellout. Um, I ask all these people to walk with me through some of these immigration sites on the Mexican side so you can see the amount of exploitation, murder, rape, disappearances of children and worse that I've seen on this side. And then then the same shit happens on that other side, you know? Some of these people can't afford to pay their way across. You know, we just went through a Black Lives Matter statue destroying, cancel the police era in the U.S. And people were talking about slavery and reparations. There's currently slaves in the United States that are basically trying to pay off their crossing into the United States illegally to cartels. And they're slaves. They're really modern slaves that are living right now in the United States. And governor, I read governor, his- governor Newsom in California during COVID had his fucking winery still open. And the, all of them were illegal workers working there. Um, I read a statistic recently um, in terms of slavery. And, you know, obviously it's up for debate on to what people want to describe historical slavery versus the modern era slavery that you're talking about. But most people who are looking into it say that there are more people in modern era slavery right now than there ever were in the history of humanity. I mean, I guess if, imagine walking into a room where there's a 15 year old girl that basically services six men a day in a hotel room. And you're gonna imagine this is somewhere in Mexico, probably, it's in Arizona. Yeah. And she's owned and she's not going to get some of that money and you know better her life or move forward. She's not a sex worker. She's a slave. The capital of abductions in the United States is Arizona. That's the capital of abductions in the United States. And there's some shit happening there that people don't realize. There's a, there's an assumption or a feeling. And again, on both sides of the political spectrum, because I have friends on both sides <laughs> uh, that, yeah, we need to build the, the wall to keep, to keep that shit from coming here. It's already here. It's been here for years growing um i think we're past a solution that is just going to be sim- as simple as closing off that border and it's part of it but it's not the whole solution what would you recommend as a potential solution i mean first off treating this as a legitimately regional problem not the mexico u.s problem this is a regional problem now um being better as americans and is speaking to our representatives to audit every single cent that is being sent down to Mexico and that has been sent down to Mexico for the government to fight this war on your behalf down there. Think about this. When I started my career, the solution to fighting cartels was putting a bunch of us in the back of trucks and chasing these fuckers around. What are you seeing right now in Mexico? The same thing. <laughs> the same solution. That's the same solution. Hmm. You hear stories about special uh, special forces. I think there was a group of 11 S- uh, U.S. Army SF guys that went down to Mexico to train some of the elite units in Mexico. Those guys don't do. Those guys are not going to make a dent in anything. They're going to arrest. The, they just arrested the uh, the son of a former cartel head in Guanajuato. Mm-hmm. Who they but they arrested their dad two years. His dad two years ago. That supposedly stopped everything, right? No, fuck no. They just arrested his son, burned a bunch of fucking cars. Uh, during Christmas, they murdered. 12, te- 12 young men and women that were part of a Christmas party in Guanajuato. And they didn't want to allow one of these cartel guys to come in there because he wasn't invited. So what he do? Came back and shot all of them. I mean, this is a problem that is just past every, everything that we... Uh, I mean, I've seen the solutions that Me- Mexico has in front of them as far as what they're trying to do. They're not, none of that's going to work or do anything. I think it's time to, for the U.S. to legitimately audit what it's been doing down there as far as influence, money, and, and, and policy. And legit cut that flow of money off until this fucking legitimate solution where there's a lot of things that actually you can actually audit down there as far as what's being done with that money. I'm a taxpayer too now in the U.S. And 
a lot of that money and I, I received that some of that money uh, through payment as far as my my salary uniforms training vehicles weaponry I, I, I'm here to tell you that that's the, it's the same money that's being pumped down there and I don't see we are entering uh, the last year was the most violent year in Mexico's history with all that money and all that uh, support and all that. El Chapo Guzman was arrested by uh, uh, U.S. intelligence and uh, the Mexican Marines doing their thing. What did that do? Nothing. Realistically, it didn't do anything. It turned one guy into three kids, and they've been doing their thing now, and you arrested his son, and that's not doing a thing to uh, cartel or stop the drug flow and people flow into the United States. And uh, people are massacred and being murdered across the country. And uh, and that's and the numbers that are out there are supplied by the government. And it's clear from some of the, the leaked documents that they're not real numbers. We have performed the even Ukrainian possible? war as far as murders and, and death oh, yeah. during the first 72 hours. We have, do you think it's have performed even, it. Do you think it's even possible to diminish or shut down the influence of the cartels in Mexico at this point? Or is it too far gone? I mean, to be honest, I think that's going to be your next war. Just right uh, at the southern border. I think that's going to be your next war. And when I say a war, I mean it's the army isn't going to do anything, and they're obviously compromised. Uh, the government that they prop up or support is a leftist, anti-U.S. and pro pro China and pro Russia government. Uh, the amount of pressure that is being built up as far as uh, some of these caravans of humanity. And again, not all of them are criminal. Not all of them are bad. Not all of them have diseases. That's all scare and fear tactic shit that people say out there. But they're all feeding a giant organization that is also supplying the United States with drugs and other horrible things. And they're also fueling a war that's killing and consuming humanity in, in Mexico at a rate that is sometimes out, out fucking surpasses a war setting. And somehow that's not in the front page news because I don't know why. I don't know why that's being kind of kept quiet. Uh, there's already talk about and has been talked about for a while, and I've talked to Congress on, on this issue, of naming some of these institutions and groups terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. And I was asked, to, you know, first off, as a Mexican national, also as, as a Mexican, you know, national, somebody was born in Mexico, somebody that actually fought against some of these organizations directly and saw some of the things that they do. And now with my activism, you know, talking to people that have gone through the process of escaping that, if they qualify as a terrorist organization, yes, I mean, you tell me. Um, are they politicized? All, most of these, including the current president, who has visited uh, El Chapo Guzman's hometown six times during his administration and has met with his lawyer and all that and basically gave his condolences when their, his, El Chapo Guzman's mother died and also closed off federal airspace over that area and called off the army to be in that area so they can have their private funeral if anybody is doubting that they can look that shit up themselves and, and tell me if they don't have some sort of connection every single candidate political candidate in mexico that has been assassinated probably has been assassinated either because they were sponsored by one cartel or the other that's why they were assassinated because these guys are political now um so they're politicized clearly uh they kill a bunch of reporters one of the most dangerous things to do in mexico is that um, we run a small media company out of Mexico called uh, Demolaire. Well, we don't run it, but we support it. And it's a sister company of ours, basically. And we, I mean, you just, I worry about them every day. You know, it's, and it's like, a, like, what can we say? And what can't we say? Or are we getting too close to something? You know, that type of stuff. It's scary. Um, so, yeah, they have that. They have, they, the ISIS got their ideas for their highly produced execution videos from the cartels. Narco blog was doing that shit before it was cool. 
You know, mm-hmm. that's where the, that's that's most of the traffic they got from from the Middle East and the ideas of how to export the terror aspect of executing somebody in a horrible way. They got that idea from Mexican cartels. So they um, some of the weaponized drone technology that you're seeing showcased in other parts of the world. Well, some of that shit was first showcased here, you know. Uh, so it's very clearly a, a space where some of these activities are very much terrorism, you know. Uh, we don't have a lot of IEDs, although we have seen a proliferation of explosives now, the mining level explosives, but we don't have a lot of spent or, uh, ordnance relying around like Iraq, you know. Yeah. But it's there. And terror is definitely being utilized to put forth some of their influences in power, not only in Mexico, but in the U.S. They're very much politicized. They meet every single part of their criteria. But if you name them, if you name them a cartel, the cartel's uh, terrorist organizations, then you have to analyze some of their dealings. And uh, if you go to Bevmo and see some of the tequilas on the stands, some of those tequila brands are sponsors of terrorism now because they're basically owned and or managed and or have some sort of ties to cartel organizations. Um, some of the series on Netflix that paid some people for rights and paid other people for some other things, you know, the people that make money off any sort of things related to that. And now they're part of that, I guess. And uh, also some of this money and some of the politics that are involved in it probably stem all the way into Washington. Ed, the picture you paint is a bleak one, (laughs) but I also, I really kind of draw a blank against arguments against what you've said. I mean, I've seen it to a degree with my own eyes. I think some of the hesitance to dig into those, you know, if you look at it like a tree, you start working from the branches all the way to the, uh, you know, the trunk of the tree and all the way down to the base. I mean, I don't think it's conspiratorial to have thoughts of, well, maybe they're not taking a look at it because they don't want to know what it actually leads to because they kind of already know what it leads to, but they don't want to publicize directly. Yeah. Um, It is a bleak picture, but I think what you painted is an honest one. And it leaves me, you know, maybe my final question for you to be respectful of your time is what can, I mean, what can the average citizen of the United States, who probably, and obviously I don't speak for everybody, but I, I'll put out a broad assessment that I think is probably pretty accurate. They don't know what to do. They yeah. hear about the border sometimes, depending on what news outlet they're hearing about it from. They know that there are things going on there, but they feel paralyzed and helpless. What can your average citizen in the United States actually do? Number one is realize that Mexico is directly being utilized as a weapon against the United States by foreign powers, specifically China. And uh, it's been said before, a lot of the Russian operatives that are uh, like working against the U S are based out of Mexico. And a lot of the, a lot of their operations are there. So it's very much being utilized as a weapon. Immigration is being utilized as a weapon. If people doubt that and people think that's some sort of conspiracy, Go to Europe and see how it's being utilized by the Russians on the Polish people. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is that people need to wake up to the fact that we as tax paying Americans, and I include myself because I'm one of them now, are paying for some of the supposed efforts against some of these things that are happening in Mexico, but we're not too good at auditing any of it. I'm here to tell you as somebody that was directly beneficiated by some of these uh some of these funds and that we work with some of these funds down there they're not they're not using them in the correct way that has to be audited directly somehow and that comes from u.s tax dollars and we have a right to see how that's being spent um it's impossible that we keep sending money down there and we just went through the most violent year in the history of mexico it's the most dangerous year to be a mexican in the history of mexico the amount of massacres, murders, and disappearances down there. And also the fact that Mexico is basically now a giant highway for the masses of the world that are trying to enter enter the United States because all of them are on the, the assumption that it's an open-door policy by the, the Biden administration, and it's now or never before the other guy gets back into power. That's mm-hmm. exactly coming from the mouths of people that are on that border right now. So that needs to be questioned. Um. 
in all probability, your next major war is going to be a, an American continental war of some sort. You know, it's not going to be a war that you won't feel. Mexico is your second largest, you know, trading partner as far as regional trading partner. Imagine if we cut supply off, of, if we militarize that border, we close it off, and we cut supply of all the all of the uh, drugs and fentanyl and everything that comes through that border. You're gonna experience a health crisis that's gonna rival even COVID in the United States as far as all the people coming off that drugs withdrawals. Yeah, and that's not something people consider. But if you think this is gonna be like a you know, invasion of Iraq or Afghanistan or some sort of foreign war. This is going to be a war you're going to smell and feel. People need to wake up to that fact if that's where we're headed. And uh, something has to be done. This has to be prioritized. It hasn't been prioritized in years. And it's festered and grown to the to such an extent now that any action to, to deal with it is, has, is going to have to be extreme. I don't want Mexico to be invaded by the U.S., I've seen what that looks like in other parts of the world. And I, as, as somebody that's from there, I don't want that to happen. I'm not a I'm not asking for that, but that's where I see this shit is heading. Whew. Again, that's a rough painting, but I think as a population and as a country, we would be better served to take a real hard, close look at that painting as opposed to brushing it aside and saying, eh, you know, I, I don't live on a border state, so it's not really my issue. I don't know anybody who's gotten a fentanyl or a drug addiction problem associated with uh, the cartels and their trafficking of drugs. It's not really my issue. We, I think we have to stop looking away from it and have to start looking directly at it to find solutions. And I would agree with you. None of them are going to be precise and none of them are going to be pristine in their ideation or their execution. It's going to be... Again, this is uh, you know, the quote, the patriot. You're, you're going to see this war in your backyard, you know, in yeah. the town centers. It's going to be closed. Mr. Calderon, what would you like to leave people with now that we're all um, completely depressed and worried <laughs> about our future? <laughs> uh, oh, God, I don't know. Um, well, first off, thank you for, 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 of course. for, for inviting me on and, and uh, allowing me to speak on some of these issues. I, of course, I, maybe this I, will help you. Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Maybe this will help you with uh, the closing. Where do you, where would you point people to educate themselves more? Oh, great! Uh, we run a small media. Uh, we run a small media company in our sister, uh, in a, and we have a, a news uh, related uh, aspect to it called Demoler. Uh, Demoler dot com, or you can find them on Instagram. Demoler. It's a small news agency. We basically report in English for the English for the English speaking market. Uh, it's run by a former intelligence analyst. I participate in it as well, and a lot of my colleagues as well I contribute information and direct uh, on the ground reporting of that nature. We have no biases. We are not. Uh, everything has to be verified. And all the news we put there is things that are very shocking and scary for us. And we think the U.S. should pay attention to demo there. Um, we also run these uh, month, uh, every three months, we basically sit down and talk about the most uh, major news events coming out of Mexico in English for the English market. Uh, you can find that on uh, the Manifesto Radio podcast uh, channel uh, on YouTube. And if people really want to get educated with some of these things, I mean, just ask your members of law enforcement, uh, talk to the people that actually work in the border patrol, not their fucking leadership, by the way, talk to people that work on that fucking war, <laughs> uh, which I, I can, I can, I can, I can say this. Uh, I've trained BORTAC, I've trained members of the border patrol, and I've also trained migrants on the Southern side of it to deal with some of the dangers they're going to be facing as far as some of my Mexico, Mexican compatriots. So I have no sides in this. I've done my work on both sides. I, I have no sin. I don't owe anything to anybody, but I can tell you from both sides is that it's fucking horrible. So if people want to know what's going on, ask the people that are there. Don't look at the news. Don't look at people reporting from afar. Don't look at some of these woke activists that are speaking nonsense about, you know, I don't know, gen uh, gender and fucking uh, identity politics nonsense. I'm an immigrant. I recognize none of their bullshit. 
I'm from Mexico. I work there. I live there. I still have interest there. I still have family uh, in Mexico. And I, I, I have a vested interest in both of these places being better and getting to a better place. And I know there's no crossing into the future as a strong nation for the United States without the partnership of, of, of Mexico and a safe and prosperous Mexico is good for everybody on this continent. We're going to need each other before the end of whatever ending is coming in front of us. And I, it, people can see some of that global, uh, how, how well the U.S. is basically retracting globally. Me the United States is going to need Mexico for what's next. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. To learn more about this issue, you can check out Ed's work at edsmanifesto.com. And if you or someone you know is struggling with a fentanyl addiction, there are things that you can do. You can call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration hotline at 1-800-662-4357. That is 1-800-662-4357. Thank you again to listening to Change Agents, an ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. We'll see you again next week with an all-new episode.